Welcome to the Open Forum, a telephone talk program designed to give people an opportunity to ask questions and discuss issues related to the Bible. Our host is Harold Camping of Family Stations Incorporated. This Open Forum has been pre-recorded. We will not be taking live calls. However, we encourage you to stay tuned and consider the inquiries that others have made. We trust this will provide insight into the Bible, the infallible Word of God, which is able to impart firm direction and offer testimony of life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Remember, this broadcast has been pre-recorded. Now we present Open Forum with our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? The Bible is the Word of God. That is the most magnificent and marvelous book this world could ever know about because it is written by Almighty God Himself. And think of it, on this program, this book is our guide. It is our authority. How wonderful this is that we can go again and again to this source book of truth, this magnificent source book of truth, the Bible. It's... Uh, it, uh, is beyond our comprehension that God would set it up this way, but He did. He did. This Bible is from the pen of God. True, He He used humans to write it, but ho as the Bible says, holy men of old spoke as God the Holy Spirit moved Him, moved them. Now uh, uh, we're looking for your question or comment from. Uh, our telephone lines, but before we take our first call, we have listeners all over the world, and one of the uh, countries where we broadcast many, many hours every evening by AM radio is South Africa, South Africa. And here we have a listener in South Africa who has sent us this question. I'm writing you for you from South Africa, and I believe in the Lord, and would like to ask if it's possible for somebody who is having spiritual problems to be saved. You, and can the devil make you believe that you are saved while you are not? Maybe by giving you all the qualities of a born-again person. If not, how will somebody know if he is not being deceived by an evil spirit that is possessing him? This question has bothered me for a long time, and I would appreciate it if you can explain to me and keep uh, blessing us with the open forum. Thank you. Well, we thank uh, this uh, listener for this question, and you know... That it is true, Satan goes about as an angel of light. It is true that he is seated in the churches and congregations and, and uh, uh, is therefore in charge of gospels that many, many, many people think are the true gospel and that is going to a gospel that will lead them to salvation. But we must remember that if it, we are a true believer... If we're a true believer, Satan has nothing on us. And the characteristic of the true believer is that he has a delight in the whole Word of God. He has a concern that he might be faithful to the whole Word of God. Or to say it the other way, if he hears or suspects that there's an area in his life or in the doctrines that he holds that they may not be as faithful to the Word of God as possible, then he is uneasy, and he's going to be concerned about that particular doctrine or that particular practice, uh, because he wants to do God's will. That is the nature of the child of God. He has an ongoing desire to do the will of God. An unsaved person who, and remember, a true believer cannot be harassed by Satan at all. Satan can't get into our life at all. But if we're not saved, then yes, Satan still rules over us, and he can cause us to, 
to uh, think we are saved when we really are not. He can cause us to have an interest in the Bible, but uh, only in parts of the Bible, and we're not ready to be obedient to the whole Word of God. In any case, it is true, even if we are a child of God, there may become times when we are not sure of our salvation. Our faith is very weak. And we're crying to God, Oh Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Uh, we uh, can, should never hesitate to go to God for mercy. Have mercy, have mercy. The wonderful thing is that if we have become saved and we're uneasy about our salvation and we're pleading for mercy, we cannot endanger our salvation at all. Not at all. And actually, as we are pleading to God for mercy, uh, it could be evidence of, of the fact that uh, we're becoming more and more broken before God. Uh, but ag again, the other side of the coin is we read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And then we wait upon the Lord. And every time we get anxious about our salvation, remember what Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 teaches. Don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to the Lord. In other words, go back again, pleading for God's mercy. Well, thank you, South Africa, for that question. And now shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping, how are you today? Very well, thank you. I was wondering if you've had a chance to look at the book of Esther again since this development of the doctrine of the end of the church age has sort of come to light. Because there is a character in the third chapter named Haman who rises up as sort of a prince within the kingdom and makes it his goal to destroy all the Jews in the kingdom and build the gallows to kill Mordecai, yes, yes. but in the end is sort of killed by his own deception, by his own gallows. Yes, I, no, I, I, uh, years ago I did go through the book of Esther very carefully, but I must admit during this last few years, I have not gone back into the book of Esther. So I'm, I would not be able to uh, qualify as a, uh, to make com com comments on the book of Esther right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold? Yes. Thank you for taking my call. Yes. I, I was at a Bible study the other morning, and some of the women stated that God is female, and others stated that he is non-gender. And I wondered, is this true? Is there anything in the Scripture to suggest this? Well, now, first of all, was the Lord Jesus Christ male or female? Is there any evidence that he was anything but... Uh, a man. He calls himself the son of man, the son of man, and uh, and all the evidence is, of course, that he was a man. Who did he pray to? His heavenly father, not his heavenly mother, his heavenly father. And so God, I, uh, as he t tells us about himself, it is that he is male, not female. Now, it's interesting, when he talks about believers, he uses both genders. He talks about us as being sons of God, but he also talks about us as being the bride of the Lamb, and the bride is female. And, uh, and because, uh, finally, with, 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 when we are saved, ultimately, uh, male or female doesn't enter into the equation. We are simply children of God, and uh, and we will be this uh, throughout eternity future. Then that was my next question. When the judgment day comes and we, you know, those who are saved rise, will they be non-gender or just the children? 
Oh, well, I don't know why we're worried about questions like that. It's, uh, the fact is that as long as we're on this world, on this earth, where there are men and women, boys and girls, they're without any question, and that doesn't change as long as this earth exists. But when we go to be with Christ, then, uh, then uh, God doesn't speak of us anymore uh, as male or female. We're simply children of God. Okay, I appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Yes, good evening. Um, question about uh, the Bible as being the... Uh, the source, and I was listening to your show the other day, and you're talking about how God does not talk in an actual voice, but um, he talks to us indirectly by um, the Bible, and since the uh, trilogy includes the Holy Spirit, I was wondering if God could use, uh, or the Holy Spirit could talk directly to a person and give them an answer by placing that answer or talking or uh, implanting a thought uh, directly in their mind. Well, uh, you know, uh, the whole business of a relationship with God is very mysterious. The business of knowing that we have received a resurrected soul, we don't understand that at all. Uh, but nevertheless, the Bible says so, and we know it's true. The fact that God says it is God who works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. We don't understand how God does that. We, we know it's true because God says so. The fact that, uh, that uh, but we know it's true that the Bible is the word of God. This is God's uh, uh, articulated revelation to mankind that we're that is that we're very certain of that uh, the fact that we can talk with God and we can pray in our minds we can pray out loud it makes no difference because God knows everything that's going on in our minds and that God will listen to us we don't understand that there's all kinds of things we don't understand but we don't have to figure it out we don't have to try to diagram it we don't have to try to to, to get it down where we can uh, anal analytically look at it, that's, that's not necessary. We simply are grateful that, that uh, we know these broad statements, these general statements that God is giving us, and we thank the Lord that we might have that intimacy with him, even though we don't understand it at all. The reason that I uh, asked was because I can see some circumstances where a person might be, say, illiterate or they're in a third world country where there are no Christians to talk about God or Jesus, and maybe um, God would have to use the, the Holy Spirit in those circumstances to actually communicate his uh, word, because how else would it get to him? Well, we can answer that. We know the answer to that. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And the only Word of God that God can be talking about is the Bible. And so if a village uh, has existed for a long time, and they have never, never heard anything of the Bible... And so people are living and dying without ever having heard anything from the Bible. It simply means that up until uh, they, the Bible gets to that village, there's never been any one of God's elect there. If God has elected someone to salvation and those who do become saved were chosen by God from before the foundation of the world, then God has all, all, also obligated himself to save that individual at some time in his life and therefore he is also obligated to make sure that that person gets under the hearing of the Word of God and uh, he might uh, hear about the Word of God through a tract 
that gets to him or it could be through a missionary that came through or through a radio broadcast or uh, it, there can be uh, many many different ways that that individual finally heard the word of God from the Bible but that is a given that has to happen before God can save that individual does that mean that if they do not hear the word of God at all they just don't know about they're completely ignorant, they, they don't know anything, and they die, that they're going to hell, or are they given another chance to where no, they're actually... They, they, it simply means that God had never elected them to salvation. Uh, he has created them. Uh, they are part of the human race that were created perfectly, and they are, but they're in rebellion against God, and God is under no obligation to save anybody. Uh, but he did choose to save a number of people he chose them from before the foundation of the world and and the, these he will save but the others whether they hear the word of god or don't hear the word of god will not become saved they have no interest in the word of god to say it in another way if in that village there uh, there's no one who is elect of god even though we came there with uh, with uh, tracts uh, and with Bibles and uh, declaring the Word of God, no one would become saved there because God had not elected anyone in that uh, in that village to become saved. So maybe in that case, the person would not go to hell because they specifically did not rebel against God because they didn't know anything, but they're not. They're Every, not saved. And it's, no, it doesn't go that way. Every human being is accountable to God because we were created in the image of God. Every human being intuitively knows it's wrong to murder, it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to commit adultery. And that's because we've been created in the image of God. And, uh, and uh, whoever, whoever... Uh, has not become saved, whether they have heard the gospel or did not hear the gospel, will stand before the judgment throne on the last day to answer for their sins. They will be found guilty, and they will be cast into hell. However, the one who has heard the gospel and, uh, and has uh, not become saved will be judged more severely from everything we can read in the Bible than those who have never heard the gospel. Uh, but in, nevertheless, in both instances, they're going to end up in the lake of fire, which is also called hell. That seems like the uh, people that don't hear about God are at least disadvantaged. <clears throat> it, it seems unfair, at least from a, a human perspective well at least from our human perspective that's because we uh, are all uh, in the dungeon together we all uh, uh, set our own uh, uh, set forth our own ideas of morality and of justice and so on but the fact is that everyone in this dungeon whether they've heard the word or not was created in the image of God he's created uh, to have a right relationship with God. Uh, the very fact that we can think in terms of a God and can think in terms of sin and justice and, uh, and uh, mercy and so on is, is because we were created in the image of God. So it isn't, it, we, we never can fault God. God is perfect. God is perfect. But as uh, all criminals do, uh, they uh, they can easily try to find fault with the judge or with the judicial system or whatever because uh, it, uh, it because they are guilty under this and and their their minds are twisted by their own crimes and their own sins and that's the nature of mankind but but we have to start with the principle that God is perfect in His righteousness perfect in his justice and and everyone standing before the judgment throne of god is being tr treated with perfect justice even though we in our twisted minds may not be able to understand it well how about if someone is um good they 
they follow the Ten Commandments, not that they know about the Ten Commandments, but they're, they're just a good person, but they never heard about God or Jesus because, let's say, they were a, they were a Native American back, you know. Well, see, the, the problem is that man by nature is sinful. And even though we try to keep, can have a set of moral values that may align with the Bible quite a bit, the fact is that that uh, we're not doing it, we're not living our life to the glory of God, for example. The Bible says whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. So anything that's not perfectly to the glory of God is sin. And, and it only takes one sin to send us to hell. We don't have to commit a whole apostle of sins. One sin can send us to hell. Fact is, there anyone who stands at the judgment throne of God will be guilty of many, many, many sins. Now bear in mind, we cannot find answers out of our minds because our minds are infected by sin. We by nature are also in rebellion against God and we, we can't find answers there we have to find answers in the Bible. And the, if you read Romans chapter 1 very carefully, you'll see there that uh, and uh, Romans 1 and Romans 2, that will help you to see that God is, uh, is uh, uh, why God is, sends people to hell. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. If someone is in a let's say, an illiterate or has um, brain damage and they hear the word of God somewhere, they become saved and they end up, because of their uh, brain damage or whatever, in a corporate church, how does that fit in with your uh, teaching? Well, you know, uh, we can set up all kinds of what if, what if. God lays down his plan that uh, if we are truly uh, uh, want to be obedient to the Word of God, the time has come when we are to leave the spiritual Babylon and, uh, and come out of her, my people, God commands. Now, God gives people spiritual ears. They, we, we leave that with God. The very fact uh, there may be uh, 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 people who, uh, who don't have a mind to understand and yet God has given them spiritual ears and let's leave that leave them with God God will take care of how he's going to handle that matter and then also if you tell somebody they have to go out of the church to become saved isn't that a work saved by works then they have to do something oh it has nothing to do with becoming saved the, the the nature of the true believer is that we want to do good works. That's a consequence of our salvation. It is not a basis for it, but a consequence. And good works are nothing more than being obedient in our practice, in our doctrine, to the Word of God. That's the nature of the child of God. We're not those who do the good work of, of leaving the church, that is, they're being obedient to God, that is not in order to ensure their salvation or to get them saved. It is a product of the fact that they have become saved and, and uh, that they have an intense desire to do the will of God. However, there could be those who are, who are uh, not saved and who will obey that command. We have to leave that with God altogether. What about someone who's not, not saved, Brother Camping? They're not saved, and we tell them you have to go out of the church to get saved. Aren't they doing a work to try to get saved? No, no. Yeah, it, it, any more than when uh, I, I understand your question. In other words, if we are saying that, that uh, the Holy Spirit is not applying the Word of God to those who are within the churches and congregations, and that is what the Bible teaches. Therefore, if there is someone there, children or are people who are still not saved, they're not going to become saved uh, by listening to the finest kind of preaching, that most faithful preaching that might be going on within the churches, because God is not saving there. But outside of the church, there is a great multitude, which no man can number, which are being saved. 
Now, that uh, once they get outside of the church, they are in an environment where God is saving. That is not a good work that they're doing to become saved. We don't know whether God is going to save that individual or not. It's still 100% the grace, the mercy of God. But it's, it's like... Uh, the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. All right, the environment in which God saves, even during the church age, was the Word of God. And so if someone is not un under the hearing of the Word of God at all, they're not g going to become saved. But now they're in an environment where they're hearing the Word of God. That's not a good work that they have done. This isn't going to get them saved. This is simply the fact that they're in an environment where God is saving. But the work, of, that doesn't guarantee they're going to become saved. It doesn't initiate salvation. Uh, it doesn't add to their salvation. All it is is it sets up the environment where God saves. And same way we can, we can apply that to the fact that the environment in which God is saving is outside of the churches. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. A very good evening to you, Brother Camping. If you may hold for just one second, let me turn my radio down. Yes. yes. I do appreciate it. I've been anxious to give you a call because you're speaking of a subject that I'm very interested in, and that's the uh, the, the soul, the resurrected soul that we receive when we re when we're saved. That brings us into harmony with uh, our Father. Um, is this a new soul that we receive that replaces the one that we currently have? The Bible says that we must be born from above. Remember, in John chapter 3, Nicodemus asked the question, Must I enter into my mother's womb a second time? In other words, he, is, uh, he has caught the, uh, the truth that this new, re this new soul we receive is just as new as the first soul we received. Uh, our, now, our first soul is spiritually dead, and God says we have been raised with Christ. Now Christ arose from the grave, and we are raised with him. When we become saved, that means there is an actual resurrection of a dead soul into a live soul. Now all of this is, is in our spirit essence, and we can't draw a picture of this. We can't diagram it in any way. Uh, this is the language of the Bible, but it does mean that our new resurrected soul is brand spanking new. It is a new soul. We now have a soul in which we have eternal life. We now have a soul in which we never want to sin again. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, that which is born of God cannot sin. And that's how new it is. Just, in fact, it's just as new as the body that we're going to receive on the last day. And let me explain that for just a moment right after this message. Every human is composed of essentially two parts that are totally integrated. We're a body and a soul. Now we can talk about the body much more readily than the soul because we can see the body. We can't see our soul. That's our spirit essence, even though it's, it's an inter it is an integral part of our personality. Our present bodies are going to be replaced, at, if we are a child of God, by a new resurrected body on the last day. Uh, and it will be, a, a, again, a brand new spiritual body. fact is, our old body may... Uh, if we have died, it may have gone back to the dust and, uh, and cannot be found anymore, and yet it will be resurrected a new body, uh, and it will be infinitely more glorious than the body that was put in the tomb. Now, the Bible speaks of our salvation as a first resurrection. That implies a second resurrection. The second resurrection will be the resurrection of our bodies. 
But the first resurrection of our soul in effectively is just as dramatic as the resurrection of our bodies, except we can't see our soul. But just think of it. My old soul, I love sin. I uh, was uh, uh, in rebellion against God. I was, uh, uh, I had no real interest in the Word of God. And now I have a new resurrected soul in which I never want to sin again. I have eternal life so that at the moment I die, I, in my new resurrected soul, I leave my body and instantly am carried by the angels to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. And, uh, and uh, while I can't understand any of this, I know it's absolutely true. So that new resurrected soul is, is uh, really something. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a marvelous, marvelous uh, work that God has done within everyone that has become saved. So then the only obstruction really to living a pure life would be the carnal mind within us? The, the, it's, uh, the problem is our body. We still, that's an integral part of our personality. And so we still have to live out our, our, the rest of our natural existence in a body that's still lusting after sin. That's why Romans 7 is so very helpful, because there we read that with my mind I serve the law of Christ, uh, I delight in the w will of God, but in my members I see another law at work. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me, f deliver me from the body of this death? And uh, that's where the tug of war goes on. Now the more we live in the Word of God, the more we meditate upon the Word of God, the more time we spend in prayer to God, uh, the more we'll be strengthened so that our, our body will not gain the ascendancy, but uh, we will do it, be doing it God's way. But when we take our eyes off Christ and when we uh, fail to spend time in the Word, uh, we can fall into sin. And because we have a new resurrected soul, it will be miserable, super miserable in our personality because we have violated our new resurrected soul. And, uh, and uh, we will, uh, we, uh, the joy of our salvation will be taken from us. Thank you, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Dr. Campy. Brother Camping, yes. Um, um, what is the difference between the rapture and the second coming? The rapture occurs at the second coming. When Christ comes, the first thing that will happen is that all the graves will be opened, as we read in John 5, verse 28 and 29. Uh, uh, the hour cometh when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth, some to the resurrection of destruction. They are the ones who will... Uh, uh, be resurrected to stand for judgment and some to the resurrection of life they're the ones whose bodies will be to come out of the tombs a glorified spiritual body and they together with the true believers who are living at that moment and who instantaneously will change be changed into their glorified resurrected bodies together they will be caught up to be with Christ in the air and that is the rapture and then Christ will begin the task of judging the unsaved who are standing here for judgment. Okay, so um, it's not where the rapture comes, and then there's seven years of, of judgment, and then he comes to, I guess, take over the earth. There's no, no possibility. That whole scenario is built on fancy upon men's ideas it has no biblical foundation the rapture is right at the last day it is the end of the world okay well thank you brother brother campy thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum uh, good night brother campy hello yes uh, good night well good night 
Um, can you read Saint Matthew five verse seventeen, please? Matthew five verse seventeen. Let's look at that. Matthew five verse seventeen. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now what is the law of God? What is the law of God? Yeah, this is, uh, this, I'm calling pretend this is like the Sabbath, and it's not like the Well, day. yes, but you see, what is the law of God? The law of God is the whole Bible. The whole Bible. And in order to understand any part of the Bible, we have to look at each, uh, uh, each uh, uh, law that we're reading about and, uh, and, read, a, and uh, read the whole Bible, to that, uh, everything in the Bible that might relate to that law in order to get a proper understanding. Now, there are people, for example, who uh, read about the Seventh-day Sabbath, but they don't read the whole law of God. They only read a part of it. They don't read all the verses of the Bible that speak about the Sabbath. And so they draw a conclusion that we're still to observe the Seventh-day Sabbath. They don't realize that they're in rebellion against God because they're not keeping the law of God. They, they have decided to... Uh, that the law that the law concerning the Sabbath is based on these verses over here, and uh, that's what they're going to follow. But they haven't checked out their conclusion against the whole Bible. But if we go to the whole Bible, we know that the seventh day Sabbath was part of the ceremonial law. It was completed in Christ. It was pointing to the fact that we're not to work in any way for our salvation and that now God has, uh, ever since Christ rose from the grave, He has uh, given us a new Sabbath, which is uh, every Sunday, uh, and it's a different kind of a Sabbath altogether from the seventh-day Sabbath. But you must read the whole Bible, and don't trust your church. One of the churches that hold a seventh-day Sabbath have as one of their founders a, a person who received, presumably received visions from God. And one of those visions, there was a halo around the fourth commandment that speaks about the Sabbath. And that right away is a giveaway that that's a false gospel because that, that particular church has as its authority the Bible plus the visions from this individual and and it's no wonder then that they can't understand the true meaning of the seventh day Sabbath but it, and it's a terrible thing when we uh, have a false gospel because it means that we're still under the wrath of God Brother Campbell Brother Campbell hello yes oh can you always read, also read Daniel 9 verse 26 to 27 I'm sorry, which? Daniel 9, verse, uh, Daniel 9, verse 26 to 27. Yes, Daniel 9. Daniel 9. And that speaks to this very issue. Because there are people today who are trying to teach the seventh day Sabbath, and they are changing the laws to suit themselves, just as Daniel 9 says that. It says in verse... Uh, 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 oh, I'm sorry, Daniel. I, I was thinking of of uh, Daniel uh, uh, seven, Daniel seven, where it talks about in verse 25, he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. This has to do with those who don't want the whole law, uh, the whole law of God. They they pick and choose certain verses, and so they come up with the fact that we have to worship on the seventh day, or they come up with laws that uh, that we can get ourselves saved by taking a certain action, and so on, and and 
all of that is contrary to the word of God. Now, Daniel 9, 26 and 27, that is, these verses are speaking about the, uh, the uh, actually they begin in verse 25, and they give two paths that, that end up with Christ coming, the first path going to the cross and the second path right to the end of the world. What is your question about this? Oh, but can you read uh, 20, 27 then? If you think you don't want to read 25. Well, he 26. shall confirm the covenant with many for one seven, one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now, there's only one time in the history of the world when sacrifice came to an end, and that's when Christ ended up, Christ went to, on the cross. That was the fulfillment of all the sacrifices. And this 70th week that is spoken of in verse 27 began with the announcement by John the Baptist uh, concerning Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And three and a half years later, a half a week, Christ uh, was the, the uh, 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 sacrifice, and that ended, up, ended all the sacrifices. And then the last half of this 70th week, goes right to the end of time. It goes to the overspreading of abominations that are happening in our day and, uh, and, and the consummation, which is Judgment Day, that is coming very soon. And uh, that is the, the last half of this 70th week. And, uh, but you see, the thing about, you see, it's in the middle of the week. That means it's not on a Friday he died, he died on a Wednesday. If you do the match, then you will be... Oh, excuse me, excuse me. It's not talking about a literal week. It's talking about a symbolical seven here that began with the, with the, uh, with the um, uh, fact that, that uh, uh, he was a, the Savior was announced, and three and a half years later, a half a seven, uh, he w became a sacrifice, for our sins. Now, insofar as when Christ went to the cross, we have to go to New Testament language, and then it's very clear, very, very clear, that he was uh, he was crucified the day before the seventh day Sabbath, the, uh, the last seventh day Sabbath that was to be observed, and that's why they wanted his body off the cross before sundown on Friday. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Candy, I really enjoy your program. It's a blessing to me. I have a couple of questions. One is um, the people's belief, or they talk about once they die, they're going to meet up with loved ones who've died and gone to heaven. Is there any scripture to support that at all? Well, the fact is that the Bible does say in Isaiah 66 that the former things are not remembered nor come into mind. Uh, and when we get into the new heaven and the new earth, and there's a good reason for that, because uh, suppose that your father and mother died before you did, and now you get into heaven and uh, you thought they were saved and you can't find them, then that would be very, very great trauma for you. And there is no suffering or sorrow in heaven. We, uh, we are there in perfect joy. But you see, once we get to heaven, our focal point will not be on family members. Our focal point will be on Christ himself. That will be so glorious and so fabulous that... Uh, that that will uh, that will there'll be an entire change in the direction of our thinking on this earth. God has designed us to have intense filial love for family members, and that is in order to build the family, because from the family come the holy seed, those who are uh, the elect of God, who are to become saved, and and in order to maintain that continuity. Throughout the history of the earth, God has instilled us with that kind of love for each other. But once we get to heaven, that those family ties are broken entirely, and we are now individually sons of God 
individually we are reigning with Christ and God has a whole brand new program that is infinitely wonderful and and beyond anything we could uh, grasp here on this earth. I appreciate that. That makes sense. Thank and one you. other quick question, and yes. that is the scripture that says in the end times that God would pour out his spirit on all men, does that um, counteract no. the one about women keeping silent? No, that you're quoting from Acts chapter 2 in the la last days. And the last days are the whole New Testament era. For the last 2,000 years, it has been God's program that every true believer, man, woman, or child, is, uh, is in, filled with the Spirit. That is, they have been qualified by God to bring the gospel and mandated by God to bring the gospel because that's what prophesying is. It's to declare the truth of God's word. And, and uh, that, uh, the only stricture God put on this was that in the, it, when the whole church came together during the church age, the women were to be silent. They were not to exercise their prophetic office in when the whole church came together. And the other stricture that still continues is in First Timothy chapter 2, where God says, hey, I permit no woman to teach or have authority over men. That is, she is not to be the teacher of a class where there are men present. And But outside of those very narrow restrictions, and they're very narrow, uh, a very minimal part of our existence. Outside of that, a woman can uh, witness just as readily as any man can. Thank you, Brother Captain. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, Brother Captain. How are you doing this evening? Very well, thank you. I was wondering um, if you could give me the... what. What is the uh, definition of the uh, 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 desolation of abomination? What is it exactly does the that mean? abomination of desolation stands in the holy place? We read in first in, in Matthew 24 verse 15. Now the holy place is where God operates. That is where the Holy Spirit is busy applying the Word of God to those who are to become saved. And that holy place has been the churches and congregations. Remember that uh, at Pentecost back in A.D. 33, uh, when the, when the, when the uh, uh, Jews were together in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit was poured out and about 3,000 are saved. That, that congregation becomes the holy place. And ever since then, throughout the church age, which has continued for more than 1900 years, the holy place is where God is applying the word of God to the lives of those who are becoming saved. And that is, has been the task of the churches and congregations. But now the abomination of desolation stands there. Two things have happened. The Holy Spirit no longer is in the midst that is, he is no longer applying the word to those who are becoming saved. And instead, Satan now is in the holy place. That is, he is ruling in that church uh, and instead of God ruling. And so he is the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, I was wondering, if I was saved, would it be all right to go to church just to hear the Word, or would that be contradicting scriptures? Well, why would you want to do that if God says, Come out of her, my, my people, uh, that you not be partaker in her, her place? Why would you go there? Number two... Uh, if God, the Holy Spirit, is not working there, uh, you can hear a fine message, but God isn't going to bring any spiritual benefit to anyone from that message. And so, uh, uh, and thirdly, it would indicate that uh, 
or you are in rebellion against God. You are actually deciding you know more than God. So I would certainly never do that. That's a, uh, one more question. Yes. Um, how do you cope with the fact that uh, so many people that aren't going to be saved in time and you're saved, how, I mean, how do you even think of something like that throughout life? You know, I mean... Well, you know, that's always a... a an incomprehensible mystery. Why did God save me? I'm no more worthy than anybody else. I'm no more uh, 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 qualified to become saved than any other individual. Why me? I never can understand that. But I know that God in His sovereign good pleasure did save me, even though I don't understand why. Uh, that is why he saved me and not a lot of other people who who uh, need salvation just as badly as I would have uh, as I needed it and uh, and so uh, we don't God is sovereign you know he is like the uh, God uses the example in Romans 9 he is like the one who is making clay vessels he makes one vessel to honor and another to dishonor and that's God's prerogative because he is uh, he is God he is sovereign God and we just leave all those questions with the Lord we we have no answers to that thank you so much brother Kevin thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum um do dr. camping brother camping yes brother camping yes I have a question Yes. Uh, when, when when we get to heaven and we're a certain age, are we going to stay that age forever? Or? Well, now you've asked another question, and I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, here we have time. You know, time is reflected in that we have one-year-olds and five-year-olds and 15-year-olds and 80-year-olds and so on uh, because uh, our age is, is a function of time. In heaven, in the new heaven and the new earth, we're outside of time. We're in eternity. And so I doubt whether we're going to see anything like what we see here, that there will be those who are young and those who are old, because that, again, is a reflection of time. But there's a lot of things we don't know and understand. We have to leave that with the Lord. Uh, one more question. Yes. At the, at the end of time, you know, when God is, is God going to destroy the devil? At the end of time, the Bible is very, very clear. The first thing is that God is going to cast the devil, Satan, and all the fallen angels that rebelled against God into the lake of fire. They are going to be there forevermore. And then following that, he will judge the unsaved of the world, the people, and they will be cast in the lake of fire. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, Matthew twenty four forty three. And after you read that, I've got a comment to make on it. All right, Matthew twenty four verse forty three. Matthew twenty four verse forty three. But know this that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered the house to be broken up. What is your comment? Hey, remember a couple nights ago a man told you that had to do with prisonment, the imprisonment, the word watch? I looked it up in the concordance and it says Pulake, and it says the act of guarding or to act as a guard, the condition or specifically the time as division of day or night, and it says to keep watch, to preserve, obey, and such, to go on forever. And that really means simply to, be, to keep watch, be watching for Christ. Yeah. And he said it had to do with prison, but it doesn't. You remember that a couple nights ago? Yes, yes. It doesn't have anything to do with imprisonment. It says to keep watch. And it means just simply to a division of day or night. Yes. What hour? Well, that caller the other night had some other exotic things that he was saying that just didn't seem to add up. But... Uh, it was too complicated for this program. Thank you for calling and sharing this. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? 
Yes, good evening. Oh, I'm Brother, Brother Camping? Yes. Um, I've got one question. Um, it regards, because you believe in... Here, just let me turn down my radio real fast. Just a second. Sure. Because um, according to what you say, the um, uh, you say that divorce is only for you know um, is you're not supposed to divorce if you're if you fornicate. Yes. But I came across a verse. It's uh, Matthew five thirty two, I believe. Yes, Matthew five thirty two. God, God says that uh, it does indicate there is to be divorce for fornication. Now, we have to read the context there. The fact is that in the Old Testament, God had, had put in a law, a temporary law, in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, that indicated that if a man found some uncleanness in his wife, he could write a bill of divorcement and put her away. The Jews had, had uh, made a shambles of that law by looking at the word uncleanness uh, as ceremonially uncleanness and a woman was ceremonially unclean if she had any kind of a discharge from her body if she had a cold, a running nose if she were in her monthly or if she uh, had any kind of a discharge she was ceremonially unclean and, and therefore they uh, were putting away their wives almost at any moment that they wished to because uh, at any time they would find their wife in that condition. Excuse me, I'll finish answering this right after this message. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. There we read, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife that is wants to divorce his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. And uh, this is based on that law of Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, and and uh, the, the Jewish men had figured out so that uh, had twisted that law so that they could write a bill of divorcement almost at any time because it was easy to find uh, to catch their wife with some kind of a discharge and running from her body which would make her ceremonially unclean so Jesus made a correction on that he says no that was not to indicate just for any kind of ceremony or uncleanness that had to do with fornication if a man found his wife in fornication that's why he said in verse 32 but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife saving for the cause of fornication causes her to commit adultery and, and then he adds another statement and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery in other words once they, that woman has been put away uh, uh, the, the, the two people who are involved in this divorce, because it takes two people, uh, they uh, they cannot marry again. Cannot marry again. Well, now uh, that uh, that uh, was making a correction of that particular law. But then later on in Matthew 19, Jesus rescinded this law. And uh, and uh, and said that had been given because of the hardness of your heart, because God spiritually had married ancient Israel, and it was God's intention to uh, to divorce Israel, which He did do. Uh, if He had not made this substitute law, then He would have had to destroy Israel, and He couldn't do that because. Uh, because uh, Christ had to come out of Israel, and there were other reasons why he wanted to maintain Israel as a nation. And so he gave that substitute law. But then he rescinded that in Matthew 19. And when he rescinded that particular command, then the disciples said in verse 10, Well, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. In other words, uh, you've taken away every possibility of a divorce, and that is true. There is not to be divorce for any reason. But All right, that, well, that explains it for me. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good night, Brother Campaign. I have two questions to ask you. 
My second one is a two-part question. My first question is, why does God give Satan so much power? Well, that's a mystery. That is a mystery. You know, if I were God, and I'm, uh, I guess God is glad I'm not God, but uh, when, when Satan uh, tempted Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden and, and Eve, Adam and Eve rebelled against God, I would have cast Eve into hell and, uh, and, and also cast Satan, who came as a serpent there, into hell. And, uh, and that would have been the end of it. But God, in his own sovereign plan, allowed Satan to get what he was looking for, to rule, the privilege to rule over man. And so man who had rebelled against God came under the rulership of Satan, and, and God did that uh, for his own sovereign good reasons, and, and we don't understand all of them, of course. And my second question is, where did the Virgin Mary prayer come from? And is it necessary to say it if we can go directly to God? I'll take it off the air. Uh, oh, Thank I'm you. sorry. Would you repeat that question, please? Was it necessary for what? Go ahead with it. Repeat your question. The Virgin Mary prayer, is it, is it necessary? Necessary? For the Virgin Mary prayer. Is, is it necessary? Oh, I see. Is it necessary to pray? to the Virgin Mary and, and the answer is uh, not only is it not necessary but it is blasphemy to do that when Jesus was asked about prayer uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, what was the answer that Jesus gave we, you pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name uh, our Heavenly Father is the giver of all good and perfect gifts. The Virgin Mary was simply another human that had to become saved, and uh, and she can't help anybody. And to pray to her rather than to God is blaspheming God. I would never want to do that. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. I wanted to know uh, what to use, uh, what type of Bible do you use, and also is it okay to use other Bibles? Well, the Bible, the best Bible that we can use is the King James Bible, in the English uh, language anyway, the King James Bible. And it has been around for about 400 years, uh, and so it stood the test of time. It is... It uh, has a Bible that has used the very best Greek of the New Testament, and uh, it is uh, it would be the Bible I would uh, that I do use and I recommend. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Um. I'm not here. I just moved to New York. I just started listening. I really appreciate your program. Um, I heard you talking to the fellow earlier about being saved and how you feel unworthy and things like that. I'm not sure that I'm a saved man myself. I was wondering, could you give us your testimony, explain what happened to you? And I'll take my your answer off the air. Maybe just explain well, how God worked in your life and things that led up to your salvation. Yes. Well, you know... Uh, God saves in a thousand different ways, and he does the full work of salvation. He can save a baby in the womb. He can save a very young child. Now, in my case, I, my mother was a child of God. My dad was not. Uh, both my parents went to church very faithfully, but my dad, as time went along, it was indicated that he was not a child of God, but my mother was, and... And I don't remember when I did not love God. I don't remember when I was not saved. I, I must have been saved as a very young child. Now, it doesn't mean that I haven't had to be chastised repeatedly because of sin in my life. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, I didn't have to do a lot of growing in grace. All of that had to happen. But... Uh, but that just happened to be the way it was. Now, we did begin to pray for my father early on, and, 
And uh, lo and behold, at the age of 61, one year before he died, he became saved. And it was very dramatic and very beautiful. And, uh, and over a period of six months, we saw the change in his life. And he died a saved man without any question. And, and uh, so here we have two extremes, really. I was saved as a young child. My father was saved a year from... Uh, the year that he died and and that's just the way God works he works uh, in in a whole lot of different ways and thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome up uh, welcome to open forum oh uh, yes hi I, uh, very well I, thank you I was wondering how you come to terms with uh with the the in revelations with the church of uh, smyrna and the church of philadelphia how do you come to terms with uh, your teaching on it well first of all the seven churches of that we read about in revelation 2 and revelation 3 are typical churches that have existed all through the new testament era uh, over or through the church age for over 1900 years but as we read about these we read that no external body like a church or a congregation uh, is uh, is uh, safe is safe uh, it isn't like when we become a child of God we have eternal life we will never lose our salvation but that's an individual basis of course but a congregation is made up of people. And we look at the church of Smyrna already, uh, even though it was only 25 or 30 or 35 years old, was already a dead church. It, uh, it, uh, it was already, uh, had come to the point where it was uh, uh, in deep trouble with God. And, and God was already warning the church at Ephesus that, You've lost your first love, and if you don't re straighten out and repent, I'm going to take away your candlestick. And on the other hand, we read about the church at Philadelphia. God had only good things to say about that. But, as we look from our superior point of his uh, vantage point of history, and look back over the New Testament uh, era, we find that all of these seven churches in time disappeared from the scene for hundreds and hundreds of years. In the location where these churches had been, there was no Christian witness of any kind. They all disappeared. Now, uh, it was God's plan, however, that even as individual churches would would uh, come under the wrath of God and, and fall away and the candlestick would be removed and uh, that he would raise up other churches because the task of getting the gospel into the world was assigned to the churches and congregations and that continued right up until our day. But then finally the Bible teaches that the era of the churches has come to an end their work is finished uh, the work of evangelization is not finished by any means but the the contribution of the churches has come to an end uh, and they have come under the judgment of god and now god is completing the work of evangelization by those outside of the church's ministries like family radio that have nothing to do with the church or fellowship groups or individuals who are outside of the churches they are the means by which God is finishing up the task of world evangelism and so and so one of my thoughts on that also was this is that just using the church of Philadelphia as an example is it, is it possible that that a church like that could have existed after that church let's let's say that a baptist church came in existence in 1820 but the people moved away and the church died but there's other doctrinal theories like that particular church that might have survived from that era or or do you know historically that that church in particular has been totally removed from the earth well we know that it's been totally removed because the the location of it 
uh, finally came uh, became an air a location where for hundreds of years there was no Christian witness. It was totally removed. So eventually the church in Philadelphia fell away, just as it was as the church of Smyrna did, and and as the church at Ephesus had already begun to. Uh, and so uh, the church that would have happened to the church of Philadelphia. Those are Thank those are f physical churches, not spiritual. Pardon. Those are physical. Well, yeah, physical you see, the church, the churches and congregations are the external representation of the kingdom of God. They, uh, they themselves are not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God uh, consists uh, eternally only of those who are true believers. The church that exists forevermore and will never come to an end is the eternal, invisible church that never ends. But, uh, but the external representation of the kingdom of God are the churches and congregations like those seven that are named in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, and like the uh, various denominations that exist throughout the world in our day. Of the physical representation of it, not the spiritual. Correct? I mean, at that time. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Within... within okay that external representation of the kingdom of God, there were some true believers, even the church at Smyrna, which had already become a dead church. There were still a few true believers there, but God was through with that church. It was dead, so that means God is not going to use it anymore. And those true believers would have, would have uh, finally come out of that and maybe started another church someplace. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mark 6.17, please. Mark 6.17. All right, let's look at that. Mark 6.17. There we read, For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John, and bound him in prison for Herodes' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Now, what is your question? Matthew twenty-four forty-three. Matthew twenty-four, yes. Matthew twenty-four, verse forty-three. There we read, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Now, what is your question? The fact is that the Greek word for prison and that second watch is the identical word, and it's in any Strong's Concordance. It's five well, excuse four. me, but why is that important? In other words, uh, just because two words are identical... That doesn't mean that those verses necessarily relate to each other. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they do not. We have to uh, we have to have a lot of other factors that have to be uh, in evidence. But just because they may be the same word, that doesn't prove anything in itself. Well, that word is not described that way. What, how would you describe prison in in Mark six seventeen? Well, it's a, in Mark 6:17. It's obvious it was a prison. It was a prison. Yeah, that's the way it's. Uh, that's where John was. He he couldn't come out of prison. He was incarcerated there. It was a prison. Now it's true that there is a prison has a watch. It has uh, the the uh, the jailer who is on watch to make sure the prisoners do not escape. And so there is that relationship. But uh, but that doesn't mean necessarily that these two verses relate to each other in any way. Why would you say that? Well, simply because uh, you you find uh, uh, the same word. Uh, you might find a word that is found forty three times, and and you can't relate all forty three verses together because you find the same word in all forty three verses. The uh, you, each verse has to stand on its own, and uh, and uh, we we 
when we sometimes it's very important that a, that a verse that a word relates to another word but then there has to be just cause for that and there has to be a lot of other information that has to be built into it but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum yes let me turn my radio off yes there was an earlier call this evening that made me think I've been following your um, depart out teachings and uh, I see the depart out command and, and I see the high places uh, the confessions you know man made things in the image of God things we look upon for strength and whatnot. but um there was a fellow who called earlier about, um, but I'm still in a church, and uh, there might be some concern there, whether or not, um, you know, because I have four young children, and what would their status be if I remained in the church? And uh, you're going to ask why I haven't left yet. Well, there are, you know, still some things that I'm not fully settled on. But um, when the caller called and said something, would this be works if we were there? Well, it occurred to me that I still read the Bible to our children and we still have family radio on and you know, things like that so they're still you know, hearing the gospel so my present status really then shouldn't affect the children unless well, you know, there's some elements of work yeah, so you know, that uh, that, I'm glad you raised that question because others have talked to me about that he, I'm the fact is that if I am in rebellion against God, if God has commanded me to get a come out of the church, but I have a better plan, I have a better plan, I'm going to be part of that church uh, because I'm not ready to come out, but I will teach my children outside of the church. Well, the fact is you're a part of that church. You, you are still attending. You are an integral part of that church. So even as you are teaching your children at home, you can't separate yourself from that church. And, uh, and frankly, I, I don't know why you want to live in that kind of a dangerous environment. Why do you want to do that? Why not just obey God and do what God has, uh, has, has, decla has declared? Uh, you, you, we have to be very careful. When we begin to set up uh, uh, scenarios that try to work around or, or somehow uh, uh, get us uh, in a special relationship to something that God has commanded, the, uh, uh, the fact is God has declared, come out of her, my people, God has declared that the Holy Spirit is not in the midst there and that Satan is ruling there and uh, therefore if I love the Lord and I have an intense and that character of the true child of God is that he wants to obey the commandment well all right then I have to get out I have to get out and and I don't have to r run any kind of a risk now, what you're, you are doing, uh, I would say, as a minimum, would be very risky. But why do you want to do that? Why, why put yourself up at risk for any reason? Well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to use the uh, principle that what is not a faith is sin. And I guess what I'm saying is that I don't consider it rebellion unless or until these other issues which I, we don't have time to discuss right now are resolved because I would think that those would cause rebellion and therefore remaining is not rebellion until uh, these other issues can be satisfied I'm, it's a very complex way of putting it together but you know, I can see the depart out command but you know, well, maybe it means depart out when the church is your particular uh, congregation is uh, but but maybe you're right too. So there's issues that need well, to be answered, know, and so I use the principle of that which is not of faith would be sin. Well, I'm yes, sure the but, Lord would want me to. But you see, where if it is not of faith, and faith ultimately is Christ. That is, if it is not of Christ, and and uh, where where do we find the laws of Christ in the Bible? In the Bible, and so if faith is not something. Uh, that is just something um, 
uh, I, I just don't have, haven't come to believe that yet. The fact is, our faith is based on what the Bible teaches the, uh, and identifies with what Christ has taught. And so, uh, uh, in order to think through that through, put it this way, that the very essence of faith is Christ himself. And if, it's, uh, if it is not of Christ, it is sin. Now, that we can understand that much more readily because Christ has given us his word. The, word, the Bible is the word of God, and, and we can really uh, make that very, very plain in our minds. And so, uh, you, uh, now, it's true that uh, we, we want to search the scriptures, but don't argue with the scriptures, but search the scriptures. If you're going to argue with the scriptures, then you've got to go down every single verse and, and find... Uh, 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 to twist that or, or shove on it or fudge on it or, or try to find some other meaning and then you've got to go to the next one and then the next one and frankly this, this whole business is taught all through the Bible you'd be going for a long, long, long time and in the meanwhile you're running the risk that God would start giving you ears that you cannot hear as he did to the Jews in Acts 28 that, that passage in Acts 28 is a real eye-opener because there there were some uh, Jews who, uh, who uh, were against the New Testament church that was just beginning and that, that was a very similar situation to where we are today because uh, God was making a change in plan there just as he's making a change in plan now. And, uh, and they, were, they were leaning against that and then when the Apostle Paul gave them uh, a full uh, uh, hearing, uh, he spoke to them from early morning till late at night, and, and he was the perfect teacher of that day because he knew the gospel better than anybody. And, uh, and then they began to argue uh, uh, to, to whether this is true or not. They began to search their minds. Is this reasonable? And then we have that horrible indictment where the Apostle Paul speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said uh, I, I, I'm going to turn from you, uh, you, uh, you God has given you eyes that you cannot see and ears that you cannot hear and I'll go to the Gentiles and he left them in their unbelief and, and this can happen when we argue with the word of God when we try to see if it's reasonable, if it makes sense, uh, the next thing we can be blinded by God. And that is super terrible. And you don't want to run that risk at all. Would you advise that if somebody feels that um, if, they, if they remain and that the part out seems like a, not totally certain, they but keep they searching the part, the scripture. They feel certainly that they have rebelled against certain things. Which which of the two would you say they should do? Uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Forgive me. Yes. Oh, Ask sorry. your question again. If, um, well, as I am, you know, I, I believe that there that it, this may be, may not certainly may be uh, the direction that we should go. But I feel that if I do go now then I'd be in great violation of things that are not yet settled. Are you saying I should just go ahead and depart anyway? It would, well, it, first of all, you can't, trust your, you can't trust your feelings. You have to trust the Word of God. Secondly, if you're a child of God, can you risk your salvation? Let's suppose that it was uh, a wrong thing to leave. Can you, are you risking your salvation? The answer is no. And if you if if you if we take a, a step that we thought was correct and and it, we learn later on it wasn't, we'd feel very uneasy about it, and finally we would uh, turn back from where we had gone. But we can't risk our salvation at all by this if we're truly a child of God. Oh my! On that note, I have to say good night. I'm sorry we can't visit longer. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night. Family Stations Incorporated has featured Open Forum, a telephone talk program of biblical discussion with host Harold Kemp.
You're invited to tune in every weekday at this time. All correspondence relating to the Open Forum should be sent to Family Stations Incorporated, Oakland, California, 94621. That's Family Stations Incorporated, Oakland, California, 94621. When writing, please indicate the call letters of this station. If you are not able to call in on this broadcast, we invite you to try again on a future Open Forum. Due to the nature of this type of call-in program, the opinions expressed are those of the participants. Open Forum is a production of Family Stations Incorporated.